Hello and good afternoon to this, the third day of the Transatlantic Slavery Symposium. My name is Andrew O'Shaughnessy. I'm the director of the Robert H. Smith International Center for Jefferson Studies, the research division of Monticello. We're partnering with Mount Vernon and the Benjamin Franklin House in London to host this Transatlantic Slavery Symposium. Our panel today is entitled Capitalism and Slavery, which seeks to generate a conversation about the economic connections between slavery and international economic development. The symposium's six sessions are being broadcast across YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter channels of the three sponsoring institutions and will be available for replay immediately after each session. Audience members can participate in today's conversation by posting questions in the comments section, which we shall discuss in the second half of the program. The topic owes much to the book by the same name, Capitalism and Slavery by Eric Williams, of which the 75th anniversary was celebrated in 2019 with a conference by the International Center for Jefferson Studies at Liverpool University and the Museum of Slavery at Liverpool. It was a particular honor to have the conference opened by his daughter, Erica Williams Connell, with whom I'm working on another conference on independence leaders to be held in November 2022 in Trinidad at the Eric Williams Memorial Library and the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine. Apart from being a historian, Williams was also the first Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago. It was his work which first introduced me to the history of the Caribbean when I read not Capitalism and Slavery, but his general history of the Caribbean from Columbus to Castro. The Williams thesis has recently been resurrected in relation to the United States by historians like Ed Baptiste, Seven Beckett, and Seth Rockman. They only employ the first part of the Williams thesis to argue that slavery played a primary role in the economic development of the United States. They do not use what is often called the second part of Williams' thesis, which attributed the abolition of slavery in the British Empire in 1833 to the economic decline of the plantations after the American Revolution. This may indeed seem inappropriate to the United States, where slavery and cotton remained profitable until the Civil War. However, the famous decline thesis was as much about newer forms of capitalism displacing other versions of capitalism, which is applicable to the United States, where the industrial economy of the North became less dependent upon the Southern plantation economy. These recent developments in historiography alone give salience to the Williams thesis. However, it's easy to forget that the main motivation for Williams was what he perceived as the neglect of the British West Indies in contemporary British history, other than in the context of writing about abolitionists such as William Wilberforce. It annoyed Williams that the islands only featured as a subject of smugness and self-congratulation with the abolition of slavery. The historiography had otherwise ignored the presence of slavery and the role of the islands in the economy of Britain. In Britain, Williams has been vindicated in this respect, that we now recognize the importance of the British West Indies. It's apparent in the number of books and articles, the number of university courses, the creation of the International Museum of Slavery in Liverpool, and indeed the awareness of uh, the topic in popular culture with documentaries and films. Peter Thompson at Oxford tells me that a third of undergraduate history students now choose the further subject on the Haitian Revolution. Nevertheless, the Williams thesis remains controversial along with the more recent work applying his arguments to the development of the United States. The discussion therefore today should be lively. I shall now introduce our panelists individually to talk about their current work in relation to our topic, 
I'm particularly pleased that we have people both working on British history and the United States. Uh, we can have a dialogue uh, about uh, the application of these ideas in both countries. Once the panelists have finished offering introductory remarks, they will join the moderator on screen for a discussion and later in addressing questions from the audience. So I'm very uh, glad to first uh, welcome Dr. Stephen Mullen, who's a postdoctoral researcher and lecturer at the University of Glasgow. He is a historian of slavery and its legacies in the British Atlantic world with an emphasis on Scotland and the Caribbean. He has a book which uh, is soon out, if it may have even uh, now appeared, um, with the Royal Historical Society called The Glasgow Sugar Aristocracy, Scotland and the Caribbean Slavery, 1775 to 1838. Please join me in welcoming Stephen Mullen. Thank you very much. Thank you for the kind introduction and also it's a privilege and an honour here to speak. Um, I would say transatlantic slavery and British capitalism are inextricably connected, evolving from the European expropriation of what they described as the new world. Unequal relationships created then underpinned capitalist development in Europe, whilst perpetuating the underdevelopment of colonial peripheries. And in this view, advanced by theorists such as Emmanuel Wallerstein, Capitalism was thus an interconnected entity, a world system defined by dependency and underdevelopment. The English, then British, had one of the largest imperial land masses. This becomes known, of course, as the British Empire after 1707, to provide labour for the cultivation of sugar, cotton and coffee estates. The Europeans turned to Africa. Uh, recent estimates suggest 12 million Africans forced into chattel slavery and British ships uh, were the largest, second highest, sorry, after Portugal, uh, for, you know, imposing chattel slavery in the Americas. So the distinguished Caribbean historian Eric Williams famously argued that Atlantic slavery was fundamental to the rise of British capitalism. What Williams described as commercial capitalism based in mercantile monopolies and slavery led to industrial capitalism based upon manufacturing. Uh, which in turn helped to destroy the system in which it was based. So we certainly see the reorientation of English trade from 1660 towards the colonies had important implications. The Americanization of 18th century British trade underpinned the Industrial Revolution, with foreign commerce acting as an engine of growth. The demand for manufactured goods intended for export generated domestic growth and reshaped business institutions, banking, and commercial strategies. Initially centered in London, imperial trade led to financial innovations, improved manufacturing capacity and improved transport networks. The English outposts of Bristol, Liverpool and subsequently Glasgow and Scotland all developed an Atlantic specialisation. My own work is situated in the latter city and the Glasgow West India merchants and Scots across the West Indies after 1775. So I'll underline two key relationships. Firstly, the Atlantic trades brought national wealth via taxes and employment generated by the imports and exports. The cotton industry is generally recognised as one of the leading sectors in the classical years of the British Industrial Revolution between 1760 and 1830. Textile employment created important multiplier effects within a paid workforce. Textiles and finished goods were exported across the world. Secondly, important is the personal fortunes acquired by traffickers and enslaved people, merchants, planters and return sojourners were invested in local economies uh, and societies. And merchant capital was a particularly dynamic force in landed estates, commercial institutions and universities. To summarise then, Atlantic slavery was not a causal factor in British industrialisation. Some historians note that the Atlantic trades represented a relatively insignificant proportion of English commerce, whilst others point to the strategic nature of industries and investments. We should also be wary of monocausal explanations. Even Eric Williams did not claim causality. We know that the rise in the English population, the development of science technology, as well as connections with other colonial zones, particularly the East Indies, all contributed 
Nevertheless, Atlantic slavery and the multiplicity of connections with slave economies was a key contributory factor in the development of British capitalism, with some regions, particularly Scotland, more profoundly influenced than others. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. We now turn to Dr. Stephanie Jones Rogers, who's an Associate Professor of History at the University of California, Berkeley. She's a historian of African American history, women's and gender history, and the history of American slavery. Her book, and it was her first book, uh, They Were Her Property, White Women as Slave Owners in the American South, was published in 2019. It won numerous awards, including the Organization of American Historians Mel Curti Prize in Social History. She's currently working on two other books, including Women of Trade, which centers the experience of African, Afro-English, and English women in the history of the British Atlantic uh, slave trade. Uh, please join me in welcoming Stephanie Jones Rogers. Thank you so much. So what role did women play in forging the connection between slavery and capitalism? And why haven't we been discussing them in the new histories of capitalism and slavery? What does capitalism look like? What does it become? What does it feel like when women are thoroughly enmeshed in its development? When we avoid assumptions that they were merely tangential to its growth? The work of historians such as Amy Erickson, Jennifer Morgan, Amy Drew Stanley, Ellen Hardigan O'Connor, and Dinah Ramey Berry, as well as others, inspired me to begin with these questions. They've called upon us to question to, and to consider the place of women in histories of slavery and capitalism and the history of capitalism more broadly. And their calls have fallen on lar largely fallen on, on deaf ears. Because of this, many of them have taken it upon themselves to offer correctives that remedy the omission and downright erasure of women from narratives about slavery's integral relationship to American and British economic development. But in important ways, their work continues to be ignored. During today's conversation, my contributions bring these questions and this work to the fore and will highlight some of the roles that white women and, and other women as well played in the interconnected development of slavery and capitalism. In my current project, I trace English, African, and Afro-English women around and across the Atlantic and document their involvement in the British slave trade. But for the sake of time, I'll briefly touch upon British women and would be happy to talk about the others as well as um, you know more about their activities um, and how they nurtured capitalism at home and abroad in our conversation later. So British women greased every part of the machine that was the British slave trade. It might be said that some women even helped to build the wheels. Women were financiers who invested in the slave trade through stock companies like the Royal African Company and its successors through private slave trading ventures, as well as by serving as securities for men working in the slave trade. They were also slave ship owners. They were merchants who supplied many of the commodities that circulated throughout the trade and sold some of the most valuable commodities that traders used to barter for captive men, women, and children on the coast of West Africa. They thereby, um, had an impact on the people and economies of three continents. Female merchants also sustained the seamen, soldiers, officers, and other employees of the British Atlantic slave trade by feeding them, clothing them, and tending to their other basic needs. These same women sometimes offered the food, sold the food, that helped to prolong the lives of captive African men, women, and children who were being prepared for sale on to British slave ship, slave ship captains who were placed in the holds of slave ships or who were already on their way to the British colonies. All of these women's economic activities ensured the slave, the slave trade's continuation. They also made sure that the people who were vital to its continuation, both free and unfree, remained alive long enough to make that happen. Even if women didn't comprise the majority of investors, ship owners, merchants, traders, slave owners, or even consumers, their actions helped to shape the contours of the institution of slavery and emergent capitalism. The slave trade and capitalism are not softer or kinder, frilly or pretty when we place women like these at the center of our analyses. It's as harsh and as and indifferent to human feeling, as brutal and as cruel as the capitalism we imagine when, we, when men are at the helm. The business of slavery, which was inextricably tied to capitalism, so thoroughly saturated British society that no one could escape, not even women. No one was immune, not even women. 
Framing it in this way may make it seem like they would want to escape, like women sought out inoculation, but these particular women didn't want to, nor did they try. I'll conclude my comments in the same way that I started them. If all of this is true, why do we continue to exclude women from the histories of slavery and capitalism? Or rather, why do we largely dismiss scholars who do include them? Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephanie. And now our third uh, panelist is Dr. Ronald Bailey, who's head of the Department of African American Studies at the University of Illinois at Urbana Ch Champaign. His books include Remembering Medgar Evers for a New Generation, published in 1988, Let Us March On, Selected Civil Rights, Photographs of Ernest C. Withers, 1955 to 1968, which was published in 1992, and Black Business Enterprise, Historical and Contemporary Perspectives. He's currently working on a book, Those Valuable People, the Africans, which examines the slave trade's role in the US and global history, especially the trade in slaves and cotton and the Industrial Revolution. He is a co-principal investigator of the Mellon Foundation project to expand the use of digital tools in studying the black experience. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ronald Bailey. Thank you, Andrew, and thanks to the sponsors of uh, this symposium for this opportunity to share work I've been um, involved with for more decades than I want to talk about. Um, my title for the book and my title for these uh, comments are Those Valuable People, the Africans, the Global Slavery Trade in Three Acts. And the three acts involve kind of periods of historical, uh, global historical transformation, one from the dark middle ages to the first global e economy act two from global commerce to industrial capitalism uh in europe the industrial revolution in europe and the third act from colonial america to the u.s industrial uh, revolution and the global um cotton kingdom of the U united states and it the, the project owes its origins to themes that emerged out of the black studies movement in the late 1960s, where the push was to focus on um, several issues. One, I think, is the imperative of intellectual history, uh, and particularly the history of Black intellectuals around the world who were writing on these topics. I'm glad that it's focused on the work of Eric Williams in Capitalism and Slavery. Uh, and there are precursors to Williams, people like Carter Woodson, W.B. Du Bois, Oliver Cox, uh, Lorenzo Green, whose book The Negro in Colonial New England is important. And then there are more contemporary uh, African and African-American Caribbean intellectuals. And I would mention uh, Joseph Inacori uh, on the Industrial Revolution in England uh, and William Verity, whose recent book ties together uh, work that he's done on the slave trade with uh, the drive for reparations uh, in, in the US. But I think it's also important that we broaden that lens because William has been the topic of a perennial debate uh, in world history, uh, and it still continues. So it's not something that's you know way back in the past. It's something that has a lot of resonance today. I think the other imperative of that Black Studies movement was to emphasize interdisciplinary perspectives. This is not just history. It's not just politics. It's not just economics. It's the conflicting views in those arenas, uh, and also um, the the uh, the importance of looking at you know classical political economy. The title of this book comes from uh, a, a mercantilist theorist named Postlethwaite, who says you know are we not indebted to those valuable people, the Africans, whose labor we are using, who produce products that are traded around the world, uh, and so on. Uh, and I just want to say that there's also work in literature and art that we have to pay attention to. So I think that that's important. But I, um, I so at, at a certain point after working on this, decided that the slave trade was kind of being isolated and studied, uh, but not in connection to slavery. And so this concept that I uh, created, the slavery trade with the RY, uh, 
in parentheses, was an attempt to pull these discussions together and encourage all of us, in a sense, to pull back the lens and understand the global context in which the slave trade and slavery was operating and its profound influence uh, on world history. Uh, and it really um, got pushed by the work of Ingerman uh, and a group of scholars who began to question the conventional wisdom that the slave trade was important in US history. You can grab a hundred US and world history textbooks off the shelves before 1950, 1960, and you would see what the conventional wisdom was, that the slave trade and slavery was important. But at a certain point, um, because of new paradigms that were being used, neoclassical economics and so on, ignoring the multiply effect, people began to say, well, maybe we overestimated the importance of the slave trade. We overestimated the number of slaves involved. We overestimated the profits per slave. We overestimated the contribution of these profits to uh, industrial investment. And so the theme that the slave, the slave trade was important um, really was invi invisibilized um, again. So that's what I've been working on, uh, especially to emphasize the centrality of cotton um, first and foremost to the British Industrial Revolution, uh, and then secondly to the U.S. Industrial Revolution. So I do a kind of introductory section on uh, the glo early global theater, but then turn to the U.S. and do uh, case studies of uh, a database of slave ships from the colonial uh, uh, office, public records office, and then uh, case studies of three waves of industrial textiles beginning with um, uh, uh, Rhode Island and the Slater Mill, the Boston Manufacturing uh, Company, and the city of Lowell, which was the first industrial city, injecting in that an important story about the uh, invention of the cotton gin on the Savannah River, uh, 50 miles from where I was born. So that's kind of the overview of the project, and um, I can talk more details about, about that uh, in our Q&A. Well, thank you, thank you Ronald. Ronald. Uh, uh, We'll get all our panelists. So, and Williams's uh, book is a good example of where the title alone must have helped sell the book. Although interestingly, not a lot of attention was given to it in the uh, 40s when it came out. It was really the 60s that uh, people started to take it on board. Um, but there's an undeniable role between capitalism and slavery, uh, the mere um, you know, capitalistic uh, structuring of slavery in the Americas, uh, the scale of the operation distinguished it from slavery in Africa and the uh, Middle East. There has though been real pushback against Williams and against um, more modern versions of the thesis applying to the United States. Uh, even while Williams was alive, uh, Roger Anstey, a British historian, uh, did a book on abolitionists, re really going back to this idea that ideas really mattered. Uh, and that, I, that it was taken up too by Christopher Brown, more recently at Columbia, University with an excellent book um, called Moral uh, the, um, Moral Capital, and uh, he really tries to show how these ideas were mobilized and became popular. Then you had Seymour Drescher uh, do a book called Econocide, um, and there have been a number of versions of this attacking from the perspective of an economist, uh, Williams's idea that the West Indies went into decline after the American Revolution. Um, and more recently, when Ed Baptiste uh, published his book, um, there was a uh, review in The Economist, and The Economist always publishes negative, uh, rather uh, anonymous reviews. There was a review that was so scathing and so negative that the uh, economists felt obliged to withdraw it. Uh, and I've never known that 
happened previously. Nevertheless, some of those criticisms were made by mainstream well-known historians with a real interest in slavery, the Caribbean and the United States, such as uh, Trevor Bernard. So what I would like to start out, and I think we may go in the same order as uh, I originally introduced you to, um, what I'd like to do starting out is just to have you speak briefly on how important you think slavery was to the development of the economy in Britain or the United States. Do you think it financed the Industrial Revolution? Do you think it was the primary reason for growth? Uh, I'm just uh, curious as to where you stand in this debate. And obviously, we're dealing here with the first part of the Williams thesis, which re really argued that uh, the wealth created from slavery was what enriched Britain and led to its Industrial Revolution. And it's problematic because most of Britain's trade, even at the height of its empire, was with Europe. And there are other factors like the agricultural revolution. So we'll start with you, uh, Stephen, and obviously, uh, Ronald, you'll probably want to respond to this in relation to the United States. And Stephanie could probably do both. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you. Well, I mean, I, I think one of the most important developments of, you know, the revival of the Williams thesis in a British context over the last decade has been the move away from Anglo-centric analyses, which have been used as a proxy for Great Britain. So we now have fresh scholarship uh, in Scotland. Uh, and Scotland is a far more persuasive case, or test case, for the Williams thesis simply because it has a smaller population. Uh, the commercial and industrial revolutions are simultaneous after the Union of 1707, uh, and there's much less capital and a much less diverse economy than England. So uh, if the critiques of capitalism and slavery uh, you know, still remain influential for England, I think Scotland uh, is, 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 is much more influenced by slavery uh, and the development of the Scottish textile industries, particularly linen, which is the precursor of the cotton industry, and linen is particularly going to Jamaica. Um, cotton, again, slave-grown produce is, you know, it's providing uh, the raw materials for the two leading sectors. It is then providing you know, high numbers of employment across Scotland. I mean, we're getting into the stage then, is the Scottish population complicit uh, or culpable? They're certainly involved in a wider slave economy. And we also need to note the significance of the LBS project, which has shown uh, the legacies of British slave ownership, which has shown that Scotland has a higher proportion of uh, compensation claimants in 1834 compared to the other home nations. Wales, Ireland, and England. So, if you're asking me, I mean, I I, I wouldn't say that slavery caused, uh, uh, you know, the development of Scottish capitalism, but it's certainly a principal determinant, or at least one of them. Uh, and it is, um, sorry, excuse me. And I think the Industrial Revolution uh, would have been much slower uh, without Caribbean slavery, principally because. Uh, Scotland's transatlantic economy was based in the trade with America, and the American Revolution obviously knocks that out. Thank you. Thank you. Before we move on, I just wanted to uh, ask you about how this is going down in Scotland, because Scotland, yeah. like, like mm -hmm. Ireland, uh, their history really is one in which they view themselves as victims of empire. Yeah. And uh, I've been contacted by the Scottish National Trust about houses in Scotland. Wow. They're reinterpreting to talk about slavery yeah. in those houses. I gather the Scottish Portrait Gallery is now yeah. addressing yeah, I mean, it. Uh, and the, 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 this is talking about collaboration, which I can't think, especially with at a strong moment of Scottish nationalism, uh, yeah. that would be very popular. Well, I think there's an interesting dynamic, Andrew, in that, that Scots, some Scots do see themselves as victims. There's no question of the British or English. And they, and perhaps, and they, are, to, they are to a large degree. And they were, yeah. absolutely. But at the same time, there's a push for independence today. I mean, a high 
about 50% of the population want independence. And this is reflected in YouGov polls mm. that is showing that Scots and Scotland are the only region in the UK, or Great Britain, sorry, that say that British Empire is a bad thing. So I think there's a push against that. And to me, Scotland seems to be much more tolerant of slavery studies. I worked in the University of Glasgow Slavery Report 2017, 2018. I never faced any significant criticism. So it seems to me, I mean, I could be wrong, and it's just based on my own personal experience that I haven't faced major criticisms. But certainly Scotland seems to be open to the questions in a way that, 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 that simply isn't the case in England. Thank you. Uh, Stephanie, your your thoughts about the thesis uh, in general, and I, I do want to specifically ask you uh, as well about the role of women, uh, but uh, just your general thoughts first. Yeah, so first I would say we need to get two things out of the way. The first is that one of the reasons why we continue to have critiques of the Williams thesis is because he said that black labor was vital to the, the economic development of, of America and Britain. And that continues to be a problematic assertion. So that's one thing. Um, second, you know, as as I think I think one of our panelists said earlier, um, you know. Eric Williams did not say that it was the only determinant factor, that it was one of many, um, one of the primary um, determinants. And I do agree with that. I do agree with the argument that slavery was fundamental to the development, the economic development of these nations, and that it was that it was absolutely fundamental to um, you know the investments in in the development of capitalism later on. So I'll I'll keep it short and sweet <laughs> at that, and well, and and let my fellow panelists um speak speak a bit more on on that point. I did want to just follow up as I did with okay. Stephen with with the same kind of question of people mm -hmm. seeing themselves as victims because generally women are seen as victims historically mm -hmm. and in gender history. Yeah, mm -hmm. and a lot of early women's history tended to be quite celebratory of the role of women uh, seeing them as. Mm -hmm progressive and positive uh, and yet your work is really quite interesting because obviously you're dealing with white women uh, some of whom were slave owners and plantation managers um, and were very much engaged in this uh, and uh, you know I recently read Laurie Glover's book on Eliza Lucas Pinckney which in many ways is celebrating this feisty very independent woman but I couldn't help thinking throughout it uh, even though she does obviously say she was a slave owner and occasionally allude to some negative aspect of that. But nevertheless, uh, you know, in a way, we should no more be celebrating her than uh, uh, leading male figures uh, who own slavery. And so I wonder how your work, uh, you know, how, and clearly getting some very positive responses but uh, mm -hmm. how it fits with some current gender history uh, and is it uh, you know new new stage in which we are much more self-critical in the way we think about this yeah so I, I think that i'm part of a kind of um core group of historians that are trying to reshape our understanding of where women fit in this broader picture particularly um the central roles that they played in the evolution of of the slave slavery regime the development of of you know cotton cultivation western expansion and the expansion of slavery into the west and in that story um you can see women's centrality to you know the slavery and capitalism question um, and so my work is, is I think, pushing um, back against this idea that all of these elements are masculine in, in character, that, you know, the, the cultivators of the cotton are masculine. Um, of course, we know that women cultivated cotton, but that we that the individuals who owned the land were, were all male. That wasn't true. That the individuals who owned all the enslaved people that cultivated that land, that cultivated that cotton, were all male. That's not true. So when we put women in that story, then we realize that women were equally invested in the, the evolution of, of slavery, the, the perpetuation of slavery, the expansion of slavery, and also 
in the investment um, in um, the the nation's economic development. So my my work is is really trying to show that um, in a in a variety of ways. Um, two two of the books at least are trying to show that in a variety of ways, and then I'm showing that in a different way in Britain by showing the centrality of of women in the Atlantic slave trade, the British Atlantic slave trade, um, where they haven't really been um, kind of situated and centered before. And there were some black and even Native American slave owners. Were there any black women or Native American women that we know of who owned slaves? Absolutely. Absolutely. Without question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. And, and and that was in both, you know, in West Africa, there were, you know, African African women who owned enslaved people. And there, there were certainly black, black as well as indigenous women who owned enslaved people in the United States context. Yes, absolutely. Okay. But they were a very small, they were uh, not yeah, to say that. Small. Yeah, very small yeah. Uh, part yeah. of the, the, the relation to the whole. Right, absolutely. Thing. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, um, I agree with most of what has been said. I, there's a lot going on in this discussion, um, you know, and, and we have to make sure we have the right pedagogical framework so that our students understand what they need to be exploring. Um, so we, we say color, class, culture, consciousness, gender, and age as a way to define the Black experience that broadens it out from just the focus on color, right? I think that's, that's, that's very important. Um, but I also, there, there is um, the history, history as presented in the world of ideas, and there is history that actually happened in the world. Carter Woodson, uh, in his review of capitalism and slavery in the 1940s, um, in the Journal of Negro History, says that Eric Williams' book is going to resonate with the oppressed people of the world and the oppressed people in, you know, Black people in the world. Because as Stephanie says, he's getting at a central historical dynamic that left people of African descent on the bottom. Uh, and the reverse of that is that intellectuals in Europe are going to be not pleased when that critique gets borne out full force in the arena of ideas. That's the debate over Williams. And certainly when that becomes a tool that liberation fighters in the street are taking up. And again, that's not just in the long distance past, that's right now with the toppling of monuments to slave owners and slave traders in the United States. You know, and so that, that politics of knowledge, I think is one of the reasons this is such a perennial debate um, that will go on uh, into the future. The other thing is to think about the theories of economics that guide these interpretations of history. So um, you will understand if I say you throw a pebble in the water and you can see the waves, that's called the, mel the multiplier effect. And so the essence of Eric Williams' argument is that it was not just the trade in bodies, right? Slave enslaved Africans as commodities where profits were made, but it was also the impact that that had on other aspects of the economy. So you needed more slave ships. You needed more food and to feed the slaves on the voyages. You need people who were outfitting the ships with sails. You needed um, Barclays and insurance, uh, you know, banks and insurance companies. And so I think one of the differences and one of the things that Eric Williams did prior to capitalism and slavery, and this is important in the lecture point, but not, but there were other people, Wilson Williams in an unpublished master's thesis. So there were people working on these questions. Um, and so the reason I emphasize black intellectual history, because I think that, you know, what is it, Motel 6 that we'll keep the light on for you. I think black intellectual history was the group that kept the light on this discussion to give future generations a chance to explore it. But we need to pull the lens back um, and make sure that these interpretations in the in the realm of ideas are consistent with what we can find out uh, about the world. And I just I, I really have trouble understanding when you look at statistics on cotton. I mean, something like more than half of all slaves went to work on plantations producing, um, you know, six or seven commodities: cotton, rice, tobacco, sugar, and a few others. Uh, and then cotton was just so, cotton grown in the U.S. by slaves especially, played a big role in the British industrialization process where um, 
I think 88% of all, 57% um, of all U.S. exports were was comprised of cotton and 88% going to Great Britain. So when you look at how dependent Britain was on cotton from the U.S. Um, and how important that was to the Industrial Revolution, I just can't see how people come to the conclusion that it was not significant unless they are, you know, imposing ideas about what they think ought to have happened with instead of what, what we can actually see. I spent a lot of time at the style mill in London, um, you know, trying to look into the records to see what story was there that was not being fully reflected in some of the debates uh, that, that we've been talking about today. Uh, uh, <laughs> was America's leading economic uh, export. Absolutely. I'm sorry, we got some interference there. Cotton was the leading export of the United States, right? Uh, up well, well the past the well past the Civil War. Yeah, right. and it, it's somewhat ironic that uh, central to Britain's industrialization, uh, you know, Britain is a sort of textile uh, capital of the world at this point, uh, and it abolished slavery in its own empire in 1833, but was still, of course, very much entangled with slavery in many of its um, imports that were necessary to uh, its basic economy. Which is it's, it's, it's important for us to clarify that relationship between industrial capitalism in Great Britain and what happened in the US, hmm. because when the founding fathers very few mothers in these discussions looked around the world to see now how are we going to pay for this American Revolution? They seized upon the idea that it was industrial textiles and cotton and, uh, that they wanted to replicate. So there's a very exciting story about industrial espionage, where you know U.S. Uh, uh, capitalists saying you know if you got any ideas about how textiles are produced and you can get them to us, we'll pay a bounty for that. So there are all kinds of exciting stories about how the U.S. stole cotton technology, cotton and, um, textile technology, and brought it, you know, first to the Slater Mill in Rhode Island and then in other mills uh, to launch um, the Industrial Revolution in, in the U.S. And I don't think that, that that story, the kind of the independent existence of industrialization in the U.S., that gets reflected in cotton exports and cotton imports. I mean, the Civil War had a lot to do with why are we sending our cotton over there when we want to manufacture it here? That was a, um, a motivating influence for the uh, Civil War. I, I should, of course, be said that Southerners were not so, uh, like Jefferson, not so keen on Northern industrialization. But part of the new literature is to emphasize that the South was part of this modernization. Uh, Often when we talk about economic development, modernization, and the, the creation of a market economy, it was in relation to Northern goods. It's now realized, of course, that the plantation world was also being modernized in uh, that it became more and more regimented. It helped to contribute to the development of accounting methods. Uh, my very first article was in a very obscure journal of accounting that I wrote with an accountant uh, and th this has now become a very popular subject of how accounting uh, in, it's called accounting for slaves uh, and in order to run an estate uh, from England uh, the owner needed more and more information which of course is now very valuable to historians um, but you know, a lot of modern accounting methods were improved um, in the South and in the Caribbean uh, because of slavery. So I wanted to ask you about the second part of the Williams thesis, which I alluded to in my introduction, uh, which he talked about the uh, uh, role of uh, the decline in the slave economy uh, to abolition. And that, of course, does not work so well for the American South, which is probably a reason why it's never been taken up, because, as we've said, slavery and cotton still remain very important. But I also mentioned in my introduction that it was becoming uh, 
and his argument wasn't simply actual decline, but that it was being displaced by other uh, forms of revenue and other types of capitalism, uh, mainly industrial capitalism, some of which was not dependent or connected with slavery. Um, would that work for uh, the, um, I mean, certainly the North uh, and why it was able to contemplate abolition uh, and to even go to war to, uh, to abolish uh, or at least prevent the expansion of uh, slavery into the West? Um, was slavery becoming more marginal to the northern economy while still being, of course, important? I don't know if any of you have got a view on that. Uh, well, I mean, I, I'll certainly speak from my British context and uh, uh, Scotland in particular. I mean, I, I think is the one thing that Eric was actually wrong about is obviously the decline thesis. Uh, I, I think we're agreed now that the, the, the West Indian slavery was profitable uh, at least into the 19th century, probably to the 1820s, maybe even to the 1930s, uh, sorry, 1830s. Um, but this has got implications then because the main Williams thesis becomes more Williams than Williams even intended. Yeah. If Caribbean slavery is profitable right up to the end of the British Industrial Revolution, the classical years, 1830, then it means Caribbean slavery is underpinning the entirety of the era. And this has got significant implications in the Scottish context, simply because Scottish connections with the Caribbean are dramatically increased after the American Revolution. Glasgow's tobacco monopoly is over and the Glaswegians, merchants in particular, then refocus on the Caribbean, particularly Jamaica. And there's a dramatic increase in Scottish immigration. And if it's still profitable, and we're thinking that Scotland has got a less diverse economy and less capital in England, this money that then is coming back while well, slavery is still profitable it's having a dramatic effect across Scotland, and this is where my work is situated. I'm interested in private fortunes, uh, 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 where it's sunk into the landed estates, which then become enclaves of little capitalism across Scotland. They're disseminating the wealth through landowners. We know from the University of Glasgow study that, that, that dramatic money goes in and bequests. It then is still managed today. You know, so what we're seeing is slavery is still profitable. Uh, and what that tells is then the abolitionists in Scotland, which were in uh, England, which, it was a brave move, particularly with the strength of the West India interest. So I'm actually noticing that we, we've got a big build up of questions from our audience. Uh, so I'm going to turn over to some of those. Uh, but I see a common theme in some of them uh, where people are saying, you know, they want us to point out that slavery was not unique to uh, uh, Britain and the United States. Uh, somebody asks about slavery today in China, um, and uh, obviously we had serfdom in uh, uh, in Russia. Um, and I, I think we understand that, uh, that that this is a general phenomenon that is still ongoing uh and that uh and it might be somewhat less organized but i need mean, there's even an argument of course for both the caribbean and the united states that the abolition of slavery didn't end uh oppressive forms of labor uh, for those who'd been enslaved uh, you know, there were various methods tried to tie people to the plantations uh, and prevent them, of course, from benefiting from the capitalist uh, system. So I've got um, a question from Cynthia Wood, uh, and this is for Stephanie. What is your opinion on Sally Hemings's, and she describes as a barter deal for her children's freedom at age 21, without including her own freedom after Jefferson. And I, I have a few views on that myself, but you the well, expert. I mean, I, I think that Sally, Sally Hemmings was in good company 
um, when she made a choiceless choice. You know, this is what historians of slavery refer to as a choiceless choice, um, you know, laying everything out on the table and just making the best decision with what's there. Um, and I think she was in, um, you know, good company. Many, many enslaved mothers um, made similar choices. Many enslaved mothers were, you know, granted their freedom, for example, and chose to be what's called re-enslaved, a, a process whereby they, you know, um, sought permission to remain in the, in the state of their of their, you know, children's birth of their own birth, so that they could remain with their families. Another choiceless choice. So I think what Sally Hemings did was, you know, what many enslaved mothers had to do, and that was to make certain sacrifices in order to to ensure that their children were taken care of in certain ways, and to to make sure that they they could remain connected to them in really important ways. So. I would uh, mention that Annette Gordon-Reed has said that Jefferson could not have publicly freed her uh, without embarrassing his white family and his daughter. Uh, and that what there's clearly uh, seems to be some kind of agreement. She was given her time, which meant she was free, free in all but name. Uh, she moved down into Charlottesville, uh, she is listed, I think, in one of the censuses as being free. Uh, and so to all intents and purposes, um, she was uh, freed on his death. Uh, but it is interesting that the only uh, enslaved laborers that he freed were his own children uh, by Sally Hemings. And what is particularly fascinating is that he applied uh, within a month of his death that uh, they be able to remain in Virginia. There was a law in Virginia prohibiting uh, emancipated uh, African Americans from staying in the state. Uh, and he gave us the reason that they wanted to be near family and friends and what they're used to. Uh, and it's particularly curious because this is a man who'd said you couldn't have an interracial society. And yet before his death was uh, pleading for members of the Hemings family. So I just- I think, it, I th I think this, the story of Phyllis Wheatley is a, I don't know, I don't say counterpoint, but another example that we should look at because here is a woman who was enslaved in Africa, brought into the U.S. on a ship called the Phyllis, purchased by the Wheatleys, you know, brilliant, got educated, rose to prominence, went to London as an enslaved person and hung out with people like Granville Sharp, the attorney. Uh, Benjamin Franklin made a point of coming by to see her. Uh, and her freedom was actually negotiated uh, with the help of her London friends, as she calls them. Um, but she came back to the U.S. And, you know, it's a little unclear sometimes when her freedom was actually recorded. But she came back to the U.S. as a free person and continued to work with the Wheatleys uh, for a while. And so that's a, that's a story of the dynamics of how women had to negotiate um, their status. And she was very much involved with almost all of the founding fathers. You know, um, Benjamin Franklin, George Washington. Uh, and, you know, she came to the Longfellow House in Cambridge, where Washington had his headquarters as they were evacuating the U.S. and met um, Washington's military family, one of which was um, uh, Green, General Green. So she had this network of people that I think people need to explore a little bit more about to understand the role of of women in that period of, of American history as well. Stephanie, this is another for you. And then we've got a question for all the panelists. And it's somewhat related to the question I asked you, so you might just want to give a short answer. But it's um, uh, from Anne Bagamary, uh, who says, do you think the narrative that women civilize and soften events in which they are actors has impeded scholarship about the role of women in your field and in others? Absolutely, in all capital letters, absolutely. Yes. Um, you know, uh, there's a, a, um, a wonderful scholar of, of 
um, Germany, um, Wendy Lauer, who argues that for some reason we need to believe that women are the softer, gentler, more angelic half of humanity. Because if we lose that hope, then <laughs> where, do, where does that leave us? And I think in many respects, you see the same tendency in scholarship around slavery, scholarship around women and slavery. Um, we need to believe that these women were the softer, the softer, fairer sex, were the civilized, you know, the civilized elements of, of humanity. Because if we don't, then then we have to really reflect upon who we are, you know, as a whole, as, as, as a nation um, in ways that we have not yet done. So I, I do absolutely agree that yes, they they are that is an impediment um, to the kind of richer scholarship, more rigorous scholarship that centers women and that includes women. Um, I think it is it's certainly an impediment to that kind of that kind of work for sure. And uh, this is from Lauren Limmer. Uh, for all panelists, how do you define race? Is it a matter of genetics or displayed features? Uh, does it go deeper than just visual appearance? I think it's very contingent upon time and place. Um, you know, in a historical context, it's it's not anything like, in many respects, anything like we we think of race today. So it really is historically contingent um, and and also geographically contingent. I think for that for that reason, um, we used to use race in our paradigm, but we changed to use color because of the debates and knowledge coming out of anthropology about the fact that there are no, no pure races, there's no biologically identifiable races. And so to, for us, color became that. And within that context, you can talk about the way people deploy the biological concept of race for ideological purposes. In other words, saying, if these people are of African descent, or they are black, then they should not, they ought not to have access to uh, American, I mean, to, to wealth or to the right to vote, which still comes up now. So I, I agree that we, we really need to, you know, bring to bear these, the history of theoretical discussions and ideas about this uh, and situate it as Stephanie was saying in, in time and place uh, to, see, to see the full meaning. Yeah, I agree with both panelists. I mean, it's certainly a race is a, a social construction dependent on, on time and place. And reading through the merchants' uh, correspondence, the planters, I mean, obviously they're, they're, they're using racialized hierarchies based on perceived, you know, uh, you, you know parentage, you, you know, one drop African blood. It's, it's defining people's uh, status in enslaved people's status. So certainly these these merchants, planters are, are, are using it for nefarious purposes and it comes into, you know, the capitalist aim. I, uh, the point uh, you made, Ronald, uh, is I think, uh, and just now as well, Stephen, uh, that it is a social construction. And one thing we can do as historians is to show that uh, these attitudes changed over time, uh, that it was sort of pseudo-science of the late 18th century, and ironically, the Enlightenment, that uh, helped to give the, this uh, spurious justification to slavery and to claim that the real biological differences, but that, that certainly wasn't believed uh, earlier, uh, and that always, I think, gives a lot of hope for change, that th these are attitudes that have evolved and they can evolve uh, again and are not in any way uh, static. Um, so uh, I think we've just got really one minute, um, and uh, I'm, not, I'm wondering, uh, Uh, if there's anything, I know there's someone here saying that capitalism only started in 1900. Uh, that's clearly not uh, not the case. Uh, um, in fact, uh, one of the and Caribbean historians took quite a leading role in this uh, and in talking about uh, black issues and Ron is been a, the longest of all of us uh, in his attention and interest in black studies. And I'm sure you're aware of, of the importance that the Caribbean 
took, and that they coined the phrase factories in the field to describe uh, the mills and plantation operations. Uh, they're some of the earliest industrial forms. Um, I remember that Adam Smith wrote Wealth of Nations in 1776, right. which we often see as the, uh, the Bible on capitalism, but we are now out of time. And so I just want to thank all of our panelists for participating. It's been a very good uh, discussion. I was curious to know what you would all, you're all thinking on this uh, issue. And I remind our audience that if they missed any of this or want to see it, uh, it's available on the YouTube and uh, Twitter channels of uh, Mount Vernon, of uh, Monticello, and uh, the Benjamin Franklin House, which I'm very fond of in London. I'm one of its advisory board members, and they are the only extant home of Benjamin Franklin, if you'll believe it. Uh, and it's in London, uh, the homes in Philadelphia and France have all been destroyed. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, soon.